Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and this is another edition of Fresh Red Kills. So Fresh Red Kills is where I talk about the books I have recently finished reading. Uh, I don't always consider these formal reviews, or in fact, I never do. It's more just me giving my thoughts. And I'll be giving my thoughts about two books. We've got Hannibal and we've got Yellow Star. Um, so let's start with Hannibal. This is not the first book that I've read about Hannibal. I think this is actually the fourth book, although it's been well over 10 years, I think, since I've read the last book about Hannibal. And despite that, and despite the fact that I, I am a middle school teacher and I teach, uh, I don't teach about Europe, um, Hannibal is somebody who comes up in class every single year because he is definitely one of my favorite historical figures to read about. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. And he is a way that I'm able to draw students into history. Um, I guess I'll just kind of explain that a little bit here um, very briefly before I get into this. Uh, we do end up looking at the Spanish conquest, especially the Spanish conquest of the Incas, uh, Francisco Pizarro and his uh, you know, kidnapping of Atahualpa and... Um, that that whole thing and we look at the advantages that the spanish had over the incas um everything from like steel to horses of course they had smallpox they were also spreading but one of the things that they also had was written language so we look at that and we in order to emphasize um because the students they often take for granted written writing way too often. So I really try to stress how important it is that the fact that the Spanish had the ability to write things down to preserve and they had the ability to read and read ancient things. So what I end up doing is, this only takes me about you know 15 minutes in class or so. I say, everybody, you know, put everything down. We're having story time. And I tell them the story of Hannibal. Uh, I start off with the first Punic War and his father Hamilcar and, you know, Hannibal around nine years old giving his oath um, you know, before his father that he will forever be an enemy of Rome, um, take them all the way, you know, of course, through you know the crossing of the Alps and Hannibal's incredible victories. And every step of the way, the students, their, you know, their mouths are basically agape and they can't believe Hannibal and how every single time he outsmarts the Romans, they're practically cheering and they're just in total awe of this person. And I take them, of course, to the Battle of Zama, and after I've introduced, you know, Scipio, and all the way down to Hannibal, you know, this is kind of a spoiler, but this is history, <laughs> uh, as an old man finally taking his own life. And they're just, they're floored, especially when we get to the Battle of Cannae, and uh, hopefully I'm saying that right, I don't always know how to pronounce this, um, and the way that he crushes a the Roman army, the biggest army Rome had ever really assembled, and he ends up crushing them and annihilating them, one of the most perfect victories in history. And they're just completely in awe of him. And right when they're at that point where they just can't believe what they've heard about this guy, I ask them, I say, how is it that I'm able to tell you with relative confidence everything that I just did about something that happened over 2,000 years ago on the other side of an ocean? You know, people speaking a language that we don't speak. Um, how is it that I'm able to tell you this story? And eventually, one of the students will always go, oh, well, they wrote it down. And then we start getting the discussion of how important it is that we have the ability to write down, that we have written language, and we have people who preserved for, you know, posterity uh, what Hannibal did. And if that didn't happen, we would have no idea about this story. We wouldn't know about these amazing um, you know, strategic moves that people can make. So we end up, what we end up doing is contrasting, you know, written language with uh, basically what the Incas had, which was really only passing down through oral history. And they also had um, a tendency to uh, basically purposely erase their history um, in order to, you know, I guess, give more power to the present ruler. So we talk about the disadvantages of that. And we played a game of telephone um, throughout the, uh, throughout the class to see how terrible um, word of mouth can be to, uh, <laughs> to pass on information. Um, but, you know, Hannibal is kind of my, he, I find that without fail, the students are absolutely fascinated by him. They, they are drawn into the history and they're right there in the moment. And you know, he always reminds me of the power that a good story has to bring people into the past. And all of like eighth graders, I teach seventh grade, all of eighth graders pass by the room. Uh, they say, did you guys talk about Hannibal yet? So even a year later, they're still talking about it. And it probably comes up in, in high school too. Uh, so they, they don't forget about this guy. And whenever I give that, 
that story each year. I'm always wondering if I am misremembering things. <laughs> you know how, how how accurate is my is my um are, are my details in this story? Um, because I told it quite a few times. And luckily, after reading this, I find that I've, I've remembered it pretty well. Um, a few little details here and there they'll need a tweak. Uh, but overall, I've, I've done a pretty good job with that. So I was excited when I saw this book. Last year for a Storathon, I saw some people reading it. And at that point, I was at a book buying ban. I'm like, I can't buy it yet. But the second the book buying ban was over, uh, I definitely wanted to pick this up because I, I love this cover too, um, this cover design. I think it's a, a great looking book. And I definitely want to get the hardcover. And I'm glad that I did. Um, Philip Freeman writes a pretty concise, uh, very swiftly read biography of Hannibal. Um, now, of course, there's many books written about Hannibal. So what is Philip Freeman trying to do here? Uh, essentially, he's trying to tell this story from Hannibal's point of view, because the only sources that we have for Hannibal are pro-Roman. So Polybius, Livy, uh, those, those sorts of writers. So he wants to tell Hannibal's story in a way that ultimately is as sympathetic to Hannibal, I guess, as you can be. Um, you can tell that Freeman does have some admiration for Hannibal. Uh, and especially when he's contrasted at certain times with Scipio, Scipio, who would become Scipio Africanus, or Africanus, however you say it, um, who, in contrast, especially when Scipio is uh, fighting in Iberia, can come off as needlessly brutal. Um, yes, Hannibal definitely had some moments of brutality, but they seem very calculated, uh, and not just him giving in to passions. But by Hannibal's, by standards of his own day, Hannibal was not overly brutal necessarily in warfare. Um, and, you know, Hannibal's genius comes out in this book, and it was good. It was, it was a good swift read. I would consider this actually a really, really good introduction to Hannibal and to the Second Punic War. Uh, the only exception that I guess I would really have to that, uh, or I guess the only caveat, um, is that I was surprised to get this book and to have no maps. <laughs> There's no images, there's no maps in here at all, because, I mean, otherwise it's it's a nice-looking book. Um, it's created by, well. like I said, I love that cover design. I was trying to find a, a chapter heading. Yeah. It's a very nice book. Um, but how something like this, which is clearly written for people who, you know, this is not, this is not a scholarly work, this is a popular history. Um, it does not have any maps of the Mediterranean. Uh, no political maps showing where Rome is in relation to Carthage or any of the other major powers. No physical maps showing the Alps and the rivers. and uh, No battle maps showing the potential formation of these uh, of these military engagements, especially something like Cannae, uh, you know, and, you know, Lake Tresemine, again, if I'm saying that right. Um, they're they're amazing battles. I mean, there there's so much drama, of course, just with reading about it. But to have the visuals, uh, you know, it would would have helped to see the the changing um, how they have basically the dynamic of power shifted in the Mediterranean over time to have some maps to compare. Uh, so I don't I don't know the reason why those sorts of things were not included in here. Um, this definitely could have used some images and some maps, especially as this is undoubtedly going to be um, used by a lot of people to first learn about Hannibal and, uh, and the Second Punic War. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I had a really good time reading this. I thought it was well done. Uh, again, it's very, it, it's not super in-depth. Um, this is, I think, intended to be a swift biography of Hannibal um, and one that is as, you know, much from his perspective as possible. Um, as can be can be done. And in that, it, it does succeed. So if you've never read about the Second Punic War before, or about Hannibal, I definitely would recommend this, but definitely get some maps as well to help you along. Um, and then, last thing I read, actually in the uh, month of January, was this. So, as I mentioned, I am a middle school teacher. Um, and one of the things that I did last year is I started a uh, history book club where Every month, uh, me and some, whatever students volunteer to participate, um, we read a book that deals with history. It can be nonfiction, it could be historical fiction, it could be a graphic novel. We change it up every month. And for February, we are reading this one, uh, Yellow Star, which is told in verse. 
So it ultimately is actually a pretty quick read. So it's written by Jennifer Roy, but it's about her, I think it was her aunt, um, Sylvia. And I'll read, I'll read the prologue here. This is an excerpt from an interview with Sylvia. That, that is not Sylvia. That's just a, I guess, a stock photo of a little girl uh, with a star of David, but um, she's a stand-in. But this is what it says from the interview. <clears throat> In 1939, the Germans invaded the town of Lodz. I don't know if I'm saying that right, Poland. Uh, they forced all of the Jewish people to live in a small part of the city called the ghetto. They built a barbed wire fence around it and posted Nazi guards to keep everyone inside. 270,000 people lived in the Lotz ghetto. In 1945, the war ended. The Germans surrendered and the ghetto was liberated. Out of more than a quarter of a million people, only about 800 walked out of the ghetto. Of those who survived, only 12 were children. I was one of those 12. So this is about the memories told in the first person, but again, it's written by the niece, um, of this child's experience in the Holocaust, in the ghetto. Uh, it, it, when it began, she was five years old. When it ended, she was 10. So this is five years living in a Polish ghetto <clears throat> and barely surviving. Now, uh, you know, like I said, this is, this is told in verse, which actually ends up being pretty effective. Um, let me see here, scary thoughts. Uh, if I can find an example here. Um, things like this. This is, this is called um, Goodbye Children. Um, this one right here. So it's, give us the children, the Nazis say. We will take them to a place where they will have food and fresh air. Parents, how lucky you are, the Nazis say. You don't have to worry about your children while you are at work. They will be cared for by us. All the Jewish children must report to the train station for deportation immediately. The trains will leave daily at noon, the Nazis say. Repeat, all children to the train. All Jewish children. Coming for the children. Knock, knock. The soldiers are going door to door, thumping their black glove fists until someone lets them in. Where are the children? Give us the children. They come at night, storming neighborhoods, kicking in locked doors with their heavy boots, searching room to room, pulling children out from their out from closets, from under beds, ripping children from their parents' arms and dragging them away. Small children, big children, crying children. If the parents try to stop the soldiers, bang, bang, the soldiers shoot them dead. Um, then we have another one of, you know, the, the following one is basically a story very similar to Sophie's Choice, uh, which is one of the most horrible stories uh, I could ever think of. So... Each, per, each of these is told, basically, from the perspective of the little girl. So, in the beginning, she's five, and then towards the end, she's ten. So, she grows up, and her perspective gets, you know, more in more in tune with what reality is and what's going on um, as the book goes on. And I thought this was a really effective read. Uh, you get a sense, of course, of what's going on, of the danger, and you really get a... Uh, look into the unsung unsung heroes of all this, like, uh, like the girl's father um, and the... He, he kind of had a little bit of a, a sixth sense or really um, a really good gut feeling uh, when they were in danger, when they needed to get out of it, and, and very clever ways of uh, keeping, you know, keeping his little girl safe. Um, so, yeah, this is written for a middle middle school crowd, really, um, you know, grades six through eight, and I think it does a terrific job with that. And like I said, because it's written in vor verse, it's, first of all, a quicker read, but also there's a certain immediacy to what's going on, um, into the language, and, you know, it, it conveys things like, uh, like the panic more and the confusion. So, I would recommend this, uh, I, I would recommend this to people who are interested in something like this. Um, it was, is this, this is the first novel that I've ever really read like this. I couldn't call it a work of, book of poetry, it's not necessarily, it doesn't read like that necessarily, but it is all written in, in verse, um, and it was a pretty interesting experience, so, yeah, I would highly recommend it. So these are the two that I, these are actually the two that I finished at the end of, uh, end of January. So we got Hannibal by Philip Freeman and Yellow Star by Jennifer Roy, both of which I would recommend. So if you've read any of these, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And as always, thank you, BookTube.